Good morning, church family. Happy Sabbath to everyone. So good to see everyone that's here today. And uh, for those who are joining us via Facebook Live we, and watching us uh, uh, from home, just uh, want to welcome you uh, today on this uh, beautiful Sabbath day. I noticed, I don't know if you noticed, but the temperature at night is getting a little bit cooler, a little bit cooler. So uh, that's kind of that's kind of nice. So I'm looking forward to uh, Looking forward to that. Um, just a couple of very quick announcements. Uh, we have a board meeting uh, this week that's coming up. So just uh, um, make uh, uh, if you're a board member to uh, mark your calendars uh, for September 15th at 6 p.m. So it's a different day. It's not on Thursdays. So uh, make sure that you um, be mindful of that. So um, that's it for the announcements. Um, uh, just want to welcome everyone uh, here today and just. Good to, good to see everyone. So let us have a word of prayer as we get uh, started. Uh, Father in heaven, uh, we come to your presence, uh, inviting your Holy Spirit to be with us, to guide us, and to uh, shine your light upon us, Lord, as we uh, have uh, and spend time with you, worshiping you and adoring you, uh, and giving you thanks for the many blessings that you have bestowed us with. Father, as we come today and we hear your word, we pray that you would bless Pastor Dave as he brings us the message. Um, may the message stir our hearts. May it be uh, words from on high. And um, may they have a transforming um, power in our, in our hearts. Uh, so, Lord, we just uh, invite you to be with us uh, and your presence in, in our hearts, not, in, not only in this building. And we ask these things in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. We're going to do the... Um, uh, offering at this time, and um, you know, I become a, I'm, I'm a grandfather now, which is kind of really I can't wrap my head totally around that. But um, so I'm a I'm a grandfather, and you know, grandparents are um, are, are interesting. I remember um, very vaguely because I, I lost my grandparents when I was they were very um, when I was very young. Uh, but I do know grandparents have a lot to offer, and so knowing that I have. Um, uh, two grandkids right now, so Juniper is only uh, two and a half years old, and uh, little George is like uh, eight months or yeah, seven months old. So um, they're pretty young, but I'm really looking forward as a grandparent to be able to just share knowledge with my grandkids. And and I think that you know the, our our older folks have this kind of responsibility. I think to share knowledge with our young people and sharing that, especially in, in our church community, it's, it's vital that we do that. So I'm looking forward to the time where I can sit down with little George and talk to him about finances or the economy or things that, you know, uh, the ups and downs that I've been through, right? You know, things that I've seen and experienced because, you know, I think it's important to pass down knowledge and information um, to, our, to our kids. Um, and that's just something that um, we do uh, as a church and and it's kind of cool that as a, uh, our church, you know, we have a very diverse church. We have a, our young people uh, that attend academy and at the elementary school, and we have, you know, retired dentists that are here. So there's a lot of knowledge um, that our church has, and, and, and so it's only valuable if we share it amongst each other. Uh, but that's one of the things that uh, our church has, and today's uh, offering is for church budget. And... Um, uh, you know, for our local church, and you know, we have needs um, in, in terms of just kind of the operational, uh, uh, you know, upkeep of, of our church, uh, and so that's just something to uh, to be mindful of. Um, and the church also serves as kind of this vehicle for these different ages to kind of come together and to share in a common goal of sharing the message of love from God um, and His children who don't know Him yet. And so I think that's kind of the ultimate goal that we have is not only to share information with our immediate loved ones, but to those in the broader family of God that uh, need to know him. So at this time, if the deacons and ushers can come forward, we'll have a word of prayer. Father God, we give you thanks for uh, the gifts that you give us, um, for the uh, talents and the means that you give us to make a living. And Lord, we ask that you would bless our tithes and our offerings as we bring and return these to you. Uh, we thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to share uh, with others and pray that you would give us a um, uh, spirit like your spirit, which is so generous and giving. So uh, we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.
At this time, uh, we're going to be blessed by having uh, Bob Thacker uh, bring us a special music. Now, um, Bob, I, I think I've known Bob for, I know for over 30, 30 years, or 30 years, because uh, he taught our daughter, uh, at when she, you know, our older daughter, when she used to be in uh, uh, primaries, saying he would play his banjo. And so here he is, uh, and I'm looking forward to his song. Well, I was out working Thursday. I do grounds work around here. And I was out working, and I got this phone call, and it was this bubbly, female voice, upbeat, positive, and it was Kim Katie. <laughs> and she had the audacity to ask me if I would do music because they needed some special music for church. I had the audacity to say yes. But I just want to... Well, well, the first off, yesterday I was moving some wood around in my back alley and lumber and stuff, and I dropped a board on this finger, and it's sore. <laughs> but that's the main one I use to press the strings to make the chords, so, but it, it, most of the time it works okay. But is anybody out here that knows the price of gold? What is gold worth? Well, no, just a, just a normal going rate. Okay, close to $2,000 an ounce. That's a lot of money for just a little tablespoon full of gold, isn't it? Now, what if you had all the gold in the world? Could you buy one soul? No way. But this song mentions gold. Treasures that money can't buy. I was driving along in the quiet countryside. Old man was walking, so I offered a ride. His face was all wrinkled, his hair turned to gray. These are the words that he had to say. I may look like a beggar, but I'm rich as a king. What I have in my heart gives me reason to sing. I am joined heirs with Jesus, so why should I cry? These are the treasures that money can't buy. Money is worthless when a soul is at stake. If gold bought redemption, how much would, much would it take? For he loved me and he saved me and he can't explain why. These are the treasures. These are the treasures that money can't buy. If you look at my clothes, they're tattered and torn. I have a new royal garment that never been worn. This cabin I live in is home till I die. I have a mansion in glory that money can't buy. Money is worthless when a soul is at stake. If gold bought redemption, how much would it take? For he loved me and he saved me and I can't explain why. These are the treasures. These are the treasures that money can't buy. Yes, he loved me and he saved me and I can't explain why. These are the treasures that money can't buy. Good morning, church family. Uh, today's scripture is found in Revelation 15, 3 and 4. And it says, And sing the song of Moses, the servant of God, the, lamb, the song of the Lamb, saying, Great and amazing are your deeds, O Lord the Almighty. Just and true are your ways, O King of the nations. Who will not fear, O Lord, and glorify your name? For you are alone and holy. All nations will come and worship you, for your righteous acts have been revealed. Thank you.
Well, good morning, church family. Once again, it's very good to be with you, and a very good happy Sabbath to you. I had a chance to say hello to a few of you earlier, and uh, some have come uh, since, so um, I just want to extend my personal welcome to you also. Um, it's cooled off a little bit this week, so we're getting to experience a little bit more of, uh, of a more temperate Arizona, and we're very thankful for that, um, and uh, hoping that those temperatures continue at least for a little while. Um, how many of you actually got cold this week? Did any of you get cold? Okay, you've been here probably a little too long <laughs> if you got cold. But uh, uh, would you join me in, in bowing your heads? I'd just like to have a moment of prayer uh, before I get into my presentation. God in heaven, we just dedicate this time to you. We, we know that you've been with us from the moment uh, we've come here today. And uh, we know, Lord, that you have uh, so many things that you want to bless us with and speak to us about. So, Father, we just open our hearts to you. We acknowledge that this is a dedicated time to you and that we just love to uh, hear your spirit. So speak, we ask, and um, we will listen. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So just a couple of quick anecdotes before I begin here. Today, uh, September 12th, marks 19 years from the day that we as a nation were uh, evaluating the events of the previous day, of September 11th, uh, 2001. And uh, I just think it's worthy of noting that uh, in a time of, of great uh, commemoration and memory of an event like that, it can, it can be a healing thing for people. It can be a healing moment. And um, it can be a time to, to pull people together. And boy, if there is ever a time that we as a people, as a nation, could uh, reflect on the things that unite us more than divide us, it can uh, sometimes uh, an event like remembering September 11th uh, can have that effect. So um, I just want to acknowledge that that is a, a very important time that we have just uh, gone through um, with remembering the events of September the 11th, 2001. But on a more personal note, it has a, a greater impact for my wife and I because we were also married on September 11th. Uh, two years before, so yesterday we celebrated 21 years of marriage and uh, had no idea that only a few years from then it would become a, a date of solemnity and a date of uh, sadness, um, yet uh, we've managed to still find uh, things to celebrate on that date regardless. So, um, But there will be a table in the floor. All your gifts for our anniversary can be placed on the table. It'll be mounded by the time you leave, and that would be fine. <laughs> Actually, uh, just uh, one of the things that I've really appreciated about moving to Arizona is uh, getting to know a new environment and wildlife. Um, I'm not uh, a, a real wildlife buff or scientist or anything like that, but I do appreciate the outdoors and uh, been able to see a lot of uh, animals that I don't get to see on a regular basis and, and things like that. We've seen um, some hawks here on campus. Toby and I thought they were Harris hawks. Toby, I haven't even told you. I looked it up. They're actually Cooper hawks, not Harris hawks. They're Coopers. And it's just neat to see that and uh, all the wild parakeets, which are often noisy, but they're very colorful. But my wife and I happened to come across a bobcat also. And that was something that uh, we've never been... And we actually surprised it. It surprised us. It was probably from me to the front pew here. It's one of the things that you see, and you're not sure if you're seeing it, but I'm glad that I had a witness with me because it definitely was uh, a bobcat and uh, just pulled out our phones real quick. But by the time we had them out, we're getting everything. It, of course, slipped into the bushes and... Uh, Anyways, it's good to uh, get to know the area and environment in which you live. And uh, that was so fun, fun experience. Um, haven't seen the javelina yet. I hear there's javelina, right? And they just love big hugs, I'm told. So we'll see how that goes. Um, in some of my previous messages and in, in some of the presentations I've made, I've emphasized, you know, how I'm trying to get to know everyone and want people to get to know me. And today, I want to really focus on the one person we all need to get to know more than anything else, of course, and that's the person of Jesus Christ. And so I'm just going to get right into uh, the message today, and I begin with my kids' quiz as always. So um, I'll just begin it this way. The New Testament shows that the early church was fascinated and passionate with the reality that through the person and name of Jesus, the world would find hope. So all I'm going to do is ask you to finish a couple Bible verses about the name of Jesus. It's really simple, and I appreciate your help. We don't have a, a huge group of, of kids here, but um, just raise your hand if you want to help me out, and I'll call on you, and you shout out the answer. In Acts 2.38, Peter said to them, repent, and each of you be this 
in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. Do you know what the rest of that verse is? Repent, Acts chapter 2, do you remember the story? Repent and each of you be this in the name of Jesus Christ. Do you know what I'm talking about? Do you, can you finish the verse? Anybody? Oh, raise your hand so I can see where you're at. Oh, Emma, hi. What, did, what was it? Be baptized. Very good. Peter said to them, repent and each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus. That's the name we're baptized into, and Peter talks about that. Another verse in Acts chapter 3, verse 6 says, Peter said, I do not possess silver and gold, but what I do have to give you, I give to you. In the name of Jesus Christ, the Nazarene, do this. In the name of Jesus, do this. How many of you sang this song growing up? All right, Toby, you know it. Rise up and walk. Didn't you sing the song? Peter and John went to pray. They met a layman on the way. See, um, Sandy, why don't you come up here and sing with me, and we'll just do a nice... No. <laughs> In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. Okay, we got to fit this into worship sometime, but we all got to learn that song. In the name of Jesus Christ, in His name, rise up and walk. Wow, being able to, to declare in the name of Jesus that someone be healed. Acts chapter 5 and verse 40, it says, They took his advice, and after calling the apostles in, they flogged them and ordered them not to do this in the name of Jesus. Okay, the apostles were not to do this in the name of Jesus. What are they not supposed to do? Any of you remember? I didn't mean to make these hard. You can look them up. I gave you the verse, Acts 540. That's in your Bibles. What were the apostles not supposed to do? because the, the Jews didn't like it. Okay, right over here. Speak or preach. Thank you. Excellent. So, thus far we've seen that the early church baptized in the name of Jesus. They healed in the name of Jesus. They preached in the name of Jesus. Just a couple more. Acts chapter 16 and verse 18. Uh, this is a story about Paul. It says a girl was following him and shouting at him, and she continued to do this for many days. But Paul was greatly annoyed, and he turned and said to the Spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to do this. And it did that at the very moment. What did it do? Now, you're either shy or these are too complicated. I don't know. Maybe this is for the advanced class. I'm not sure. All right, Toby, you're, just, you're there, so we're going to give it to you. To come out, that's right, come out, and it did. So in the name of Jesus Christ, they exercise authority over evil spirits as well. Okay, last one, and then I'll uh, revise my, my kids' quizzes to be a little more uh, engaging. All right, Acts, or excuse me, Philippians 2, verses 9 through 11. Hopefully, you'll recognize this verse. It says, for this reason also God highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name. Now, I just, I'm emphasizing this aspect of the name. The name which is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus... Every this will bow, which of those are in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and at every this will confess that Jesus Christ is uh, Lord to the glory of God the Father. So what is every this will bow? What's, what's going to bow? Okay, over here again. Every knee, yeah, that's the part, that makes sense. Every knee is going to bow, and, whatever, and what's going to confess? Every this will confess. Was that putting your arm up and then you went, no. <laughs> I don't know what it is. All right, you've got, you got it over here. Every tongue confess. Thank you for participating. Now, just notice for, with me for a moment. That was just a, a little exercise for us. But notice that in the early church, how important it was to recognize and know the man Jesus Christ and the name of Jesus. They baptized in His name. They preached in His name. They healed in His name. In His name, they exercised authority over demons. And in His name, they worshiped. They recognized the bowing of the knee and the confession of the tongue all because of His name. What is it about this name? What is it about this man, Jesus, that exercised so much interest and, and power that people would dedicate their lives to Him? There's many ways we could evaluate the, evaluate the man, Jesus Christ. Today, I want to take you through a little history. History. What is it about Jesus that even an hour of solemn contemplation upon His life can calm the soul and soothe the raging mind and bring hope to hurting hearts? Who was this man? 
And when you got up today, perhaps you looked at a calendar, you looked at your cell phone or your computer, and maybe you noticed the date. Okay, I mentioned earlier it's now September 12th, but it's the other part of the date I want to reference now. 2020. 2020. 2020 what? 2020 years from what? It's from the life of Jesus Christ. That's what 2020 stands for, right? 2,020 years from the life of Christ. Now, uh, for many of you growing up, when I learned that B.C. stood for before Christ, the natural assumption was that A.D. stood for after death. Did any of you remember thinking that when you were going? I I certainly did. Of course, that would would eliminate the life of Christ, right? Because before Christ and after death. No, A.D., as we know, means anno domini. means the year of our Lord, right? 2,020 years from the time of of Jesus Christ. It's funny that in modern uh, circles now and in scholarly circles, they're eliminating the ADBC thing and they're saying that BC is now BCE before the common era and AD, they now say, don't, don't say AD, say CE, the common era. Now, you can do that all day long if you want, but if you really dig down and say, well, what separates the before common era to the common era, even in those secular circles, you have to answer, it happens to be the man, Jesus Christ. He is the hinge of history. It is Jesus who divides the calendar of the past to the new calendar. In the ancient world, years were measured by the reigns of king. It was in the 15th year of Hezekiah, or in the 6th year of King David, or in the 15th year of Augustus Caesar. Everything was measured by the the time of the current king. Well, that became very confusing. So, by the 6th century, as the influence of the Caesars was fading and the influence of Christ was increasing, a Scythian monk named Dionysus suggested that the calendar be measured not by earthly kings, but by the king of kings, and it should be measured by the life of Jesus. And he called it the Anno Domini, the year of our Lord. This model caught on, and now the whole world, whether they recognize it, like it or not, the whole world now abides by this measurement of the method of defining history. Great kings, think thinkers, leaders, both good and evil have come and gone, but they have not overturned the influence of the year of our Lord. Muhammad died in the year of our Lord, 632. Genghis Khan died in the year of our Lord, 1227. Martin Luther died in the year of our Lord, 1546. Napoleon, no matter what he could do, could not overturn the year of our Lord when he died in 1815. Abraham Lincoln died in the year of our Lord. Lord, 1865. Charles Darwin died in the year of our Lord, 1882. Karl Marx died in the year of our Lord, 1883. John Lennon, as popular as he was, he could not overturn the year of our Lord when he died in 1980. Stephen Hawking, for all of his scientific wisdom and genius, died in the year of our Lord, 2018. Every time you look at a calendar and you read the date, it's the year of our Lord. Who, is it? Who can make the claim that they had the ability to change the calendar like Jesus Christ? These great figures who left major legacies in history, again, whether good or evil, are all measured by the life of one man, Jesus Christ. And it just begs the question, who was this man? Whose birthday is the number one celebrated birthday across the entire world? Is that a trick question? Who's second? Do you even know? Nobody's second. Nobody comes close. There's only one man whose birthday is recognized virtually across the entire planet. Why is New Year's Day eight days after Christmas? Now, I know that historically Jesus was not born on December 25th, okay? We can talk more about that later. But why historically does our calendar begin January 1st, literally eight days after December 25th? Because within the Jewish culture, a child was named and dedicated 
eight days after their birth. So literally eight days after Jesus was born, his name was registered and marked in the Jewish temple. Eight days after his birth is when the name of Jesus came into our world in an official context. December 25th, 26th, 27th, 28th, 29th, 30th, 31st, January 1st. Every time the calendar rolls over, historically the reason is because that is the date when our world celebrated the coming of Jesus into the calendar. The cross, the instrument of Christ's atoning sacrifice, is the single most recognized symbol, religious symbol in the world. It adorns more graves, decorates more jewelry, and is found in more artwork than any other symbol. Again, what's second? Nothing comes close. The power of Jesus' name is so potent that even those who don't know him, like him, or believe him will still use his name when they want to curse and swear. It's his name that's used, whether they like him or not. Nobody swears in the name of Muhammad. Nobody swears in the name of Buddha. Forget religion just for a moment and try to think historically without prejudice. And even the most ardent skeptic is forced to ask, who was this man? Not long ago, a history professor from Yale, his name is Pelican, wrote, Regardless of what you think of the man, Jesus of Nazareth has, had, has, been more, has been the most dominant figure in Western history for almost 20 centuries. Again, regardless of what you think. As Christians in the Western world, we're sometimes so close to the impact of Christ that we fail to discern the full influence and overriding effect that Jesus has had on our world. If, again, Even as secular as our worlds become, we still are so close to the reality of the teachings and person of Jesus Christ. Sometimes we need to step back. Like a magnifying glass on an elephant, we need to step back to see the full and complete image. If aliens had been watching our planet in the first century and observing the ebbs and flows of the world, what are the odds that they would have picked the humble carpenter from Nazareth to have a more powerful influence than the mighty empire of Rome? Again, think about it. If you were a, a, a third-party observer and you're looking down at the first century, say, well, is it going to be Caesar who's going to have a more lasting legacy or is it this uh, carpenter named Jesus? Jesus was one Messiah among many in the world at the time. He had no pedigree, no college education, wrote no books, held no office, commanded no military, military and was not wa- well-traveled. His followers were totally unimportant, mostly uneducated, terribly ordinary, and laughably small. And yet today, 2,000 years later, we name our children Peter, James, and Mary, and we name our dog Caesar, Nero, and Brutus. Who was this man? All because these disciples followed Jesus and left us an example Jesus' impact was so obscure at the time that only one reference to his name can be found outside the Bible. By any first century writer, that is, a man by the name of Josephus. And yet today, there is no other name more spoken and recognized on planet Earth than Jesus Christ. 2,000 years later, it's impossible to think of a world without recognizing his influence. Imagine a world without the person and influence of Jesus. Imagine a world with no Jesus, no church, no Christians, no Christianity. Now, sarcastically and quite maliciously, some wish that this were so, but they are absolutely short-sighted and ignorant of history and of reality. Imagine a world with no apostles and no missionaries, no Justin Martyr, no Clement of Rome, no St. Patrick or St. Francis of Assisi, no Luther, no Zwingli, no Hudson Taylor, no David Livingston, no William Miller, no Joseph Bates, no Martin Luther King Jr., no Dietrich Bonhoeffer, no John Wycliffe, John Calvin, John Wesley, John Bunyan, John Milton, John Paul, John Huss, or John Knox. Now, whether you recognize these names or not, as you sit here today, you are a beneficial recipient, at least in some way, of each of their expressions of Christ and Christianity. And our world would be greatly different without them, do- without them dedicating their lives to this one man, Jesus Christ. The Christian church is different than all other social structures in the world. It is a revolutionary idea And it was a revolutionary idea when it began. In the ancient world, there were families, there were tribes, there were nations, there were language groups, 
ethnic groups, social groups. There were work guilds and labor unions and schools of philosophy. There were tribal religions, local gods, and and family idols. But nothing like the church had ever existed before, even in Israel. No one really knew what to do with the church when it started. It didn't have a name or designation. They were simply called the followers of the Christ and eventually Christians. The church is a body of people who believed, the church was a body of people who believed that God loved everyone equally. And again, this was radical to the ancient world. This was not taught. In Colossians chapter 3, Paul would write that in the church, there is no distinction between Greek and Jew, the circumcised and the uncircumcised, the barbarian and the Scythian. Scythian was just like another way of saying barbarian. They were the horse people that would ride in wild and, and uncivilized. The barbarian, he says, there's no distinction. J- Greek, Jew, barbarian, Scythian, slave and freeman. But Christ is all and in all. This, this was, nobody had ever taught this before. So as those who've been chosen of God, holy and beloved, put on a heart of compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. No matter what your ethnicity, no matter what your economics, no matter what your background, when you're in the church, there's no distinction. And Christ is in you just as much as He's in the rest of us. In what other social structure in the world do we see this principle more greatly displayed than in the church? Where before the church... Was there ever a moment that actively sought the inclusion of all genders, all classes, all nationalities, all languages, all people? Where? Where? Before the church, not only was there not a movement like this, there wasn't even an idea like this. An idea that taught that all were created equal, all have dignity, all deserve kindness and compassion. And now 2,000 years later, we see the diversity, we see the color, the languages, the accents, the background stories, the uh, variety of God's creation in His church today. And all because 2,000 years ago, a humble carpenter taught his followers to love all people. Who was this Jesus? Now, that is not to say that Christianity and the church have always lived up to Christ or to say that without Jesus there had been no development of human equality, but as a matter of historical fact, our, mo- our modern understanding, uh, understanding of fairness and equal rights can be traced back to Jesus. He is the hinge of history. He turned the page of human history and opened a new understanding of human kindness and compassion. Just about everyone living today believes that life is a story that's supposed to get better. Almost everyone believes that. We believe that things are supposed to improve. And when things don't improve, we still, we feel this sense of injustice. When we lose a job, when we lose a loved one, when there's some great loss in our life, we don't just sit back and say, well, that's it. We say, that was a wrong. That was an unfortunate thing. That's not how life is supposed to be. The point is this, this type of positive, advanced, progressive thinking is itself attributable to Christ and His teachings. Before the church, before Christ, the general worldview was not that life is a story that's supposed to get better, but that life was a series of ups and downs, kind of what you think of when you think of karma, okay? And if you happen to be born in an upswing, that's your privilege, and don't even worry about those on a downswing. They're just slaves and beggars. Don't worry about them. And if you happen to be born on a downswing and you were a slave or a beggar, don't bother those in, in, uh, in, that have privilege. That's just your lot in life. That was the dominant theory of life before Jesus came. The very idea that all should aspire, all should abr- progress, all should dream of a better future is found in Christ. Speaking of the ancient mindset, Jesus said, It is not to be this way among you. Whoever wishes to be great among you shall be your servant. Whoever wishes to be first among you shall be your slave. And Jesus taught that the way in which we progress and find peace for our world begins with humbling ourselves first before God and then to show compassion and kindness to our fellow man. Again, now think of a world without Christian compassion. Think of a world without Christian compassion. There's always been forms of compassion in the world, even before Christ, but Christ and His message formed a fundamental change in how humankind relates to those less fortunate. Before Christ, the weak and defenseless were not valued. In Greece and Rome, 
Only those who are wealthy, beautiful, noble, healthy, privileged, were considered worthy or important. Those who are sick, weak, diseased, deformed, disabled, slaves, servants, the young, the defenseless, they were considered annoyances at best and treated as second class. Children, children in particular, were treated very differently before Christ and His message. In the ancient world, children were a necessary burden, a ton of investment, a possible threat, and a temporary or a temporary annoyance that would only become valued at an age when they would start contributing rather than taking from the family resources. Infanticide was common and acceptable. A Norwegian sociologist wrote an interesting book on how Christianity changed the world's view of children. The book is called this, note the title, When Children Became People, The Birth of Childhood in Early Christianity. In ancient Rome, if a family had a child they did not want, whether they were poor and couldn't afford it, or maybe they were rich and didn't want to divide the family wealth too too much, or maybe the child was deformed or diseased or illegitimate, or maybe the child was an unwanted gender, they simply killed it. Now, what gender do you think was the unwanted gender of the ancient world? Female. Female. Historians estimate that for every three boys born, one girl was killed. A Roman citizen in 1 B.C., right about the time Christ is born, right? In 1 B.C., a Roman citizen wrote to his pregnant sister and said this, if you have a boy, let it live, but if it's a girl, expose it, which was a way of saying kill it. The first century Roman philosopher, first century, right? Roman philosopher Seneca, he wrote these words, mad dogs we knock on the head, a fierce and savage ox we slay, sickly sheep we put to the knife to keep them from infecting the flock, unnatural progeny we destroy, we drown even children who at birth are weakly and abnormal. Yet it is not anger but reason that separates the harmful from the sound. It was all very reasonable in the ancient world to make an arbitrary decision about whether your child lived or died. Nothing, nothing uh, that would be shocking. That is until Jesus came along and said, let the little children come to me and do not forbid them. And have you ever wondered why the Bible says he took even the infants? There's emphasis in that. The Bible says he took even the infants in his arms and blessed them. I always wondered what, what was remarkable about Jesus. I mean, that's a wonderful thing, Right? until you realize that in the ancient world, the infants were not valued. And for Jesus to take even the infants was a radical thing for any rabbi or messiah to say, no, this child has value. And then he shocked the world. He shocked his followers when he said, unless you become, unless you are converted and become like a little child, you cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. The ancient world simply did not think like this. And by the way, That ancient mindset is growing in our world today. Now, Jewish law demanded for care of orphans, but very little was done or organized to realize this command. But the church would eventually get the picture, and the church would begin to take in the unwanted children and start orphanages. Now, just think to your history. In the ancient world, when someone had an unwanted child and, and they weren't willing to kill it, where did they take it? Did they take it to the governor's palaces? Did they take it to the police? Did they take it to the schools of philosophy? Where did they take the unwanted children? They took them to the abbeys, the monasteries, the churches, the chapels, because it was the church that said we ought to care for everyone. In the second and third centuries after Christ, Christians by the name of Beningus of Callistus and uh, Dijon, respectively, were actually martyred. They were actually killed by their own community. Why? Because they advocated caring for deformed children that resulted from failed abortions. What they suggested was so radical, they actually paid with their lives because they said, no, we should care for these children. Widows were similarly disliked by Roman society. There was actually a punitive tax on widows who outlived their husbands. It was considered rude in the Roman world for a wife to outlive her husband. How dare you do that? You need to pay more, right? That is until the church began to take in widows and provide for them because Jesus, on the cross, looked at his mother and made provision for her before his death. He entrusted her to John, and the church changed how society looks at widows and women. 
because of Jesus. In the book, The Rise of Christianity, sociologist Rodney Stark suggests that there are two main reasons why Christianity grew so exponentially in the second and third century. Now listen to this. Two main reasons, according to this sociologist, why Christianity grew so exponentially in the second and third century. One was the churches advocating for the fair and humane treatment of women. And second was due to two major epidemics. Okay? The church grew during epidemics in the second and third century. The first was the Antonine Plague in the second century. The second was the Plague of Cyprian in the third century, both believed to be measles or smallpox. They would be so bad that, in, that some cities would lose up to a third of their population. At one time, it was said that 5,000 a day were dying in Rome, and even the Caesars themselves would die during both of these plagues. The plague was so devastating that people would literally throw both the dead and the dying into the streets and alleys to rid themselves of this disease. But a small community of strange people called the church would pick up the dying and care for them. They brought them into their homes, even to their own peril. They did this because the Jesus that they worshiped was a healer. And he touched the sick, the lepers, the lame. He showed, showed love and compassion for the wasted of society. Their hospitality was not lost on the community, and people became believers by the scores. By the fourth century, the first concept of a hospital was created. By the sixth century, virtually every monastery had a hospital attached to it. Again, remember your history. Where did people take the sick and the diseased and the dying when there was no other place for them to go? Where did they go? What organization was willing to accept them? Was it the philosophers? Was it the, the governors? Who was it? It was the church. To the monasteries and hospitals today owe their existence to the message of Jesus. Jesus changed how the world views compassion. Jesus taught that all deserve love and kindness and care and dignity. Think of a world today. Just think of a world today with no Red Cross, no St. Jude's, no Good Samaritan, no Loma Linda, no St. Anthony's, no Salvation Army, no ADRA, no Compassion International, no World Vision, no World Relief. All organizations dedicated to relieve the suffering of the, of the very weakest and vulnerable. And they do it because a man called Jesus taught us to love and show compassion to the very smallest. Who was this man? Now that is not to say that Christians have always been altruistic and compassionate. We fall far short in many ways. And this is not to say that society would not have developed its own idea of human compassion eventually. But again, it's simply a matter of historical fact that it was the followers of Christ who embraced a carpenter's message and an example and ushered in what we now appreciate as common sense compassion. It was not common sense before Christ. Philosopher Mark Nelson said, if you were to ask what is Jesus' influence on medicine and compassion, I would suggest to you that wherever you have an institution of self-giving for the lonely, be it schools, hospitals, hospices, orphanage, orphanages, for those who have no ability to repay, this probably has its roots in the movement of Jesus. Who was this man? Jesus changed how we think about education. He taught that we must love God with all our heart, all of our soul, and all of our mind. Again, before Christ, aside from a select few, the vast majority of people are educated only as much as was necessary to perform a task, a service, or a trade, if they received any education at all. But a new group of people called the church began to dream of ways to enlighten this beautiful God-given thing we call a mind and a brain and through education, they believed they would grow to know God better. The early church taught that all truth is God's truth. And they began forming societies and schools for education, and they called them universities. The first was in Bologna and then Paris. They quickly spread to Rome, Naples, London, Vienna, Heidelberg, Prague. All the major universities in Europe were began by people who believed Christ wanted us to be inspired by His universe. Ironically, science as we know it today, or perhaps as we once knew it, owes its very existence to Christ and Christianity. 
Some of the greatest early scientists wrote as much about theology as they did science, Newton and Kepler. In contemplating the cosmos, Kepler said, again, in contemplating the cosmos, Kepler said, I am merely thinking God's thoughts after him. I think that's kind of beautiful. I'm merely thinking, when I, when I look at that, I'm just, I'm reading the mind of God after he's expressed. Dinesh D'Souza writes, science as an organized, sustained enterprise arose only once in human history in Europe in the civilization then called Christendom. In America, 121 of the first 132 colleges and universities were started by people who follow Jesus. Now, guess which school had this in their student handbook? Quote, Let every student be plainly instructed and earnestly pressed to consider well the main end of his life and studies is to know God and Jesus Christ which is eternal life, and therefore to lay Christ in the bottom as the only foundation of all sound knowledge and learning, and seeing the Lord only giveth wisdom, let everyone seriously set himself by prayer in secret to seek it of Him. Want to guess which school had that in their handbook? Harvard. A lot has changed, haven't it? Many schools today are not just non-Christian but are openly and actively anti-Christian, including Harvard. Just two years ago, Harvard punished a Christian group on campus, their sole offense for believing the values of Christianity. One writer wrote in the um, Washington Examiner, anti-Christian discrimination is now the only form of bigotry acceptable at the modern university. A lot has changed. Not only did the followers of Christ establish schools, it was the work of missionaries and Christians that wrote nearly every early dictionary, every early grammar, every early lexicon and vocabulary. They saw these works as essential tools in making Jesus better known. Noah Webster said, education is useless without the Bible. He would go on to write his own Bible version as well. In many cases, the very first word written in a newly created written alphabet was the name of Jesus. The Cyrillic alphabet was invented by a man named Cyril in the 9th century because he wanted the Slavic peoples to have a way to read the Bible in their own language. Nearly all of Eastern Europe and Russia now benefits from a written alphabet because of a follower of Jesus. The Bible itself is now translated into over 2,200 languages. What book is second? No other comes close. Even the, the second is the Tao Te Ching, but it doesn't come close. All this because of one man named Jesus. How can one man have so much of an overriding influence? Who was this man? Ellen White says, from Christ, all truth radiates. Apart from Christ, science is misleading. Philosophy is foolishness. Those who are separated from the, from the Savior will advance theories which originate with the wily foe. Christ's life stands out as a contrast to all false science, all erroneous theories, and all misleading methods. Notice she says Christ's life, the very fact that He lives, stands out as a contrast The further we get away from Christ, the more we see these ancient traditions arising in our society. And I have yet to say much about art. Think of a world with no Christian expressions in art, music, literature, architecture, no Michelangelo's David, no Sistine Chapel, no Da Vinci's Last Supper, no Brunelleschi's Dome, no Handel's Messiah, no Gates of Paradise, no Pilgrim's Progress, no Amazing Grace, no Hagia Sophia, no Angelus of Malay. I could go on for a year. Think of how Jesus changed political science and theories of human rights. Perhaps you've heard these words before. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal and have been endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights. These truths were certainly not self-evident in the, Christian, or in the ancient world. Rather, What changed? A man named Jesus Christ came along and showed us that God loves all people equally and uniquely. And his follower, Paul, would write that in the church, there is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor freeman, there is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. Just look around this room for a second. We are the living realization 
of this reality. Look at the different backgrounds. Look at the different colors. If we were all to start speaking, we'd hear different accents. We have different stories. We come from different socioeconomic levels. But in this place, we are one. In this place, you're my brother. In this church, you're my sister. There's only one social structure in the world that exists like this. It's the church. Thomas Cahill, from whom I get my sermon title, it's the first place I've read this phrase, hinge of history. He wrote this, about this verse, that's Galatians 3.28, you are all one in Christ Jesus. He says this about this verse, this is the first expression of egalitarianism in human history. These things simply did not exist before Jesus Christ. You may argue that certain Old Testament passages teach as much, but perhaps not with as much direct clarity and focus. Virtually every celebrated reform movement has its roots in Jesus Christ, whether it's abolition, women's suffrage, prison reform, justice reform, how we care for the mentally challenged to disturb and the disturbed, civil rights, all have at their core a definite and direct foundation in the teachings of one man, Jesus Christ. Jesus taught us to love our enemies, respect our authorities, serve our communities, pray for wrongdoers, help the suffering, call out injustice, seek the lost, save as many souls as possible. We know this, we love this, but this was new until Jesus came. The Jews should have known it, and a few were trying, but Jesus came and perfectly exemplified God's plan for humanity, and we've never been the same. Who was this Jesus? Have you met him? Do you know him? You know, he who shaped history wants to shape you as well. He who turned the page from the ancient selfish mindset to the newer selfless, loving, compassionate mindset can change you as well. He's the only one who can. He is the hinge of history, but it's not just his story. He wants it to be your story as well. He can help you turn the page from the past to a newer and glorious future. In 1926, Dr. James Allen Francis wrote this, one solitary life he was born in an obscure village, the child of a peasant woman. He grew up in another obscure village where he worked in a carpenter shop. Until he was 30 when public opinion turned against him. He never wrote a book. He never held an office. He never went to college. He never visited a big city. He never traveled more than 100 miles from the place where he was born. He did none of the things that are usually associated with greatness. He had no credentials but himself. He was only 33 and his friends ran away. One of them denied him. He was turned over to his enemies and went through the mockery of a trial. He was nailed to a cross between two thieves. While dying, his executioners gambled for his clothing, the only property he had on earth. And when he was dead, they laid him in a borrowed grave through the pity of a friend. Twenty centuries have come and gone, and today Jesus is the central figure of the human race. and the leader of mankind's progress. All the armies that have ever marched, all the navies that have ever sailed, all the parliaments that have ever sat, all the kings that have ever reigned put together have not affected the life of mankind on earth as powerfully as that one solitary life. Who was this man? His name is Jesus, and it's at this name that every knee will bow Every tongue confess that He is the Lord. Who will not fear you, O Lord, and glorify your name? For you alone are holy, and all the nations will come and worship before you, for your righteous acts have been revealed. Will you pray with me? Father in heaven, in this brief and limited way, it is wonderful to see how you have affected so much of our world in a positive way. 
And the fact is that you have not left and gone away. You are still here with us. And just as you have been with this world since the time of your ascension, and you have impacted the world and the lives of so many, we know, Lord, that every single solitary soul is still important to you. And just as you can shape the centuries, and you can shape history, you want to shape us as well. You can change our world, but you want to change us as individuals. Lord, please help us in this journey that we are on. Please help us, Lord, as your church to represent these values, to represent these teachings, and have the power that is associated with knowing your name. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Happy Sabbath, everyone. I hope you have a wonderful day. I do look forward to seeing you again next week, and we're going to continue working as a church about what the next steps are for our worship services moving forward. So God bless you.